Hello, Legionnaires. Steven Schleicher. And, man, I don't know what happened, but somehow we have an entire episode missing. I've been looking high. I've been looking low. I kind of know how this happened. Bad uh, file management on, on somebody's part. It's mine. Yet. But uh, um, we are missing... An entire episode that features The Hunter and The End of the Legion in an Adventure Comics number 358 and Adventure Comics number 359. And I'm only realizing this now that we've recorded five, well, about three months in advance. We recorded this back in September. It's now December. I don't know what happened to it. And I apologize. So instead, we are going to jump ahead to Adventure Comics 360. The Legion Chain Gang and Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen 106. And we're going to be referring back to the previous episode because this was a two-parter. I have no idea what happened and I greatly, greatly apologize for that. In the meantime, we do have other episodes coming, don't worry. We still need your support, patreon.com slash major spoilers. Maybe we can afford an assistant who can come in and keep all this stuff straight. Again, I apologize, everybody, but please enjoy this episode of The Legion Clubhouse. They were the heroes from the future. Teenagers protecting the universe from those that would sow the seeds of chaos. Each had unique powers and abilities. And though they often had their differences, they came together to save the day as the Legion of Superheroes. Now you can be a part of their adventures and learn the history of the future in the Legion Clubhouse. This week on the Legion Clubhouse... It's a Scooby-Doo moment. We've been waiting two weeks to resolve this cliffhanger, folks. It's a good one. No, it's not. Shut up. Adventure Comics number 360, The Legion Chain Gang. Published September 1967. Written by Jim Shooter with art by Kurt Swan from Shooter Layouts. The underground Legionnaires work to free their pals from Universo's tyranny. Tonight, there's gonna be a jailbreak. Last time we left our heroes, they were all in prison. Or at least some of them were in prison. Some of them were now part of the Legion Clubhouse Underground. The Underground Legion. And this is actually kind of interesting because this issue introduces us to uh, a couple of things. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is the influence. The influence. The influence, which is just like, as this issue goes on and they keep talking about the influence, it becomes mm. creepier and creepier each time they say it. Until, of course, you find out what it is. What is it? We will, we will find out. It's a secret. The other thing that this issue debuts is the Legion Espionage Squad. Yes. The Espionage Squad actually is something, and I didn't realize that it was this late in the game, because I could have sworn that there were references to the espionage squad earlier, but the espionage squad is basically a sub team of legionnaires led by chameleon boy and invisible kid and using the heroes who don't have the big flashy destruction powers, but who are really good at infiltration. Yeah. Espionage also shrinking yeah. violent, not violent shrinking <laughs> violet. Although, you know, later she will become yeah. very violent. Yeah. Uh, also a uh, phantom girl in on this. Yeah. Yes, and Duo Damsel is useful as well, because in this issue, she gets to be a duo and also a damsel. Well, and that's, that's somewhat helpful as well. Uh, our heroes are all locked up in prison, so we have to stage a prison break. <laughs> didn't we just do this? Yeah, didn't we just do this not too many, too many issues ago where they were in the Super Stalag of Space? And yeah, now here's was... Superboy cracking uh, giant diamonds and... And letting these Roman gladiator guys stare at them in their hot, sweaty attire for days at a time. You can make everything creepy. That's just... A, not yeah. me, it's the comic books. True. Super Stalag of Space was Adventure 344, which would be 16 months earlier. Mm -hmm. It's a little early for the Mort Weisinger every three years you have a new audience theory. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, though, because that was not a shooter story. That was one of the last stories before a shooter came in in Adventure 344. Right. I wonder if this is little Jimmy deciding to, you know, do something that he saw before better and more to his liking. Uh, well, if it was 16 months previous, mm -hmm. maybe not. I mean, it would be really it'd be interesting to track 
what the printing schedules were back in the time period. We know that if the cover date is September of 1967, this would be on the stands three months prior to that. And and so that would put us at what, um, July, June? June, I think, yeah. And so if we know that by this time, Shooter has done how many issues at this point? Shooter showed up in 347, okay, 346. So, al- so almost 15 issues. So he's had about 15 months into this. And then if you are writing, I mean, currently uh, we solicit three months ahead of time. And oftentimes creators are working six months or more ahead of time on stories. Mm-hmm. So it'd be very interesting to see if Jim Shooter read one of the, these uh, final issues and said, hey, I'm going to I'm going to do this better. And then, <laughs> you know, 16 months later, we have this. That's the only thing that I would question is what's the behind the scenes timeline that we don't know. Right. Right. And that's something that's that's difficult, too, because issues are printed out of order. The street date on this issue is July 27th of 1967. Okay. So. Yeah. So that's, yeah, two and a half months before. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting. We get the, uh, the Legion espionage squad. Dun, 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 we also dun, get to dun, see the dun, uh, dun. heroes running around in their street garb and... I don't know if I would, if I was Karate Kid, be running around. I mean, that's not my name. Right. But in his uh, little leotard that he's wearing, mm-hmm. it's got KK on the on the cover. Well, you also got to realize, if you look at Karate Kid's costume, and not merely the costume that he's wearing now, but the costumes that he has worn, you know, in 2018, looking back at the history of Karate Kid costumes. Mm-hmm. There's a line in an issue of the Legion from about 1987 where somebody says, man, Karate Kid wore some truly astounding rags, and they did not mean it in a positive sense. Karate Kid, I think, spent all of his uh, points on mana and strength, and so his charisma was his dump stat. (laughs) I guess, because um, he doesn't pull off a lot of clothes very well. If you look at like group shots of these other ones, like Mm -hmm. we have uh, Shrinking Violet. And she's mm-hmm. got a nice little pink ensemble. Right. And we have, um, uh, I Bouncing don't know who this is wearing his costume. Yeah. He's wearing his normal outfit. Uh, star boy is looking very Reggie mantle ish, I guess in his haircut and stuff, but he's, he's wearing something a... that has kind of a zippered up star on front. Like you might find yeah. at a hot topic. <laughs> Invisible kid, of course, is wearing his tracksuit Dracula outfit. I and... like the velour tracksuit. I think that's awesome. I think that's the costume he should have stuck with. And Chameleon Boy is wearing a scant from Star Trek The Next Generation. Yeah. Yeah. Very, I mean, it's very interesting to see them out of costumes. It's something that we don't see. I guess one of the, one of the problems that I have with costumes in general, or superheroes or cartoons or anything in general, mm-hmm. is that I hate it that they never change clothes. We never really see them in other clothes. And this is an issue where we get to see our heroes wearing something different. And I understand the reasoning. You don't have to write in to podcast at majorspoilers.com and say, well, you know, Stephen, the reason why Charlie Brown never changes his clothes is because that is the look that you need to know that Charlie Brown's wearing a yellow with black zigzag shirt because you know that that's Charlie Brown. And we need to know that um, Colossal Boy wears this crazy cowboy getup because that's Colossal Boy. And I understand that, but I don't know. I, I liked seeing people in different clothes every once in a while. I think that it is confusing, especially in the days of four color printing. Oh yeah, we have a big have uh, we have a big old uh, printing error this week. We have a another blue brainiac hand, which you know, it's one of the things that you run into. And even with you know different hairstyles and different body styles, there are points here where I see Karate Kid and think, is that Starboy? Is this Invisible Kid? So it's not as though. It's not still a problem, even for me. You know, I've read this story probably 15 times. I've read a Scrapillion comic books, and I know exactly what a Kurt Swan Starboy looks like. And I'm still like, wait, which one is that? Mm. So, yeah, I get it. I, I, I really do like it. There's actually an old issue where uh, Blue Beetle and G- Booster Gold go out, and they're wearing cool 80s shirts with these hypercolor prints. And I'm like, yeah, Blue Beetle wearing a hypercolor shirt. Yeah. And then halfway through the issue, you have that coloring error where Blue Beetle is printed as blonde. And Mm. I'm like, wait, this is confusing. Yeah. I I mean, I totally understand it. It's just 
I enjoy seeing them in different costumes and in different clothes. And I think more cartoons and superheroes and whatnot should do the should do that. But hey, like when Atomic Robo wears a pork pie hat. Yeah. I mean, let's get more of that or let's get more of Ben 10 wearing some something else besides the same clothes all summer. I mean, I know he's out road, riding the road with his grandfather. And he's only got clothes. one pair of clothes. Maybe. You know, Maybe. He doesn't want to take a shower, so he showers every 12 years. Ow, I tripped, says Chameleon Boy. <laughs> oh, no. What is this MacGuffin which has caught my little pixie boots? Oh, hi, Mark. It's a lair. A secret lair. <laughs> it is, but not just any secret lair. Oh, no. The last time the Legion ran into a secret lair, it was the secret lair of the Batman. Yeah. We got to go back and, and see the buried, hidden chamber of Batman, and the Legionnaires can use all the equipment in there to do what they need. This time... Oh, they stumble upon a uh, layer of high science and technology. Oh, this must be someone awesome from back in the day. And what could this person be doing? Oh, let's dig around. Oh, no. This this uh, lab just happens to be belong to, uh, to Lex Luthor. You can tell because he's monogrammed everything with LL. Yep. It's, it was constructed in the mid-1900s, which can only mean one thing. And that that bothers me because it really Elon Musk be, it could be more than one thing. Jeff Bezos, you guys, yes. But Luthor's lair not only has food and comfortable beds and gear that they can use; it has a food synthesizer and a clothing machine that can instantly duplicate the Legion's costumes. Man, that Luthor is way ahead of his time. Where where is uh, honorary member Luthor? Uh, he no longer exists. No. There was a retcon. <laughs> Honorary him on the head. Issues ago. He grew hair and therefore he could no longer be the bald right. member of their society. And then he went back in time, lost his hair and created a, you know, a closed loop. And mm -hmm. that's why Lex Luthor continues to exist. Meanwhile, in the hall of the president of the United Planets. Blast, they should have been captured by now. Still, why worry? I will go into this hidden chamber and talk to this boy sitting on a chair. Now, Little Lord Fauntleroy jacket boy sitting on a chair and not moving. So, again, this is a problem and this kind of reinforces what we were just talking about with costumes. Mm -hmm. Some artists like Kurt Swan tend to draw generic people very generically. Mm-hmm. And boy, this boy sure does look very generic. He's a generic boy. Well, and we're not supposed to recognize that we know him Is yet. he James Dean? Is he not James Dean? I mean, we get a full close-up of his face. The boy's just asleep. And his <laughs> and evil Darth Sidious is over there going, huh, soon I will Darth, turn him to the dark side. Have you heard the tale of Darth Plagueis the Durlin? But it turns out that this boy is not... Uh, not asleep. He's been faking it. He and his father, the president of the United Planets, are immune to whatever it is that's going on. Yep. And he has a secret plan to break his way out using a secret scrap of metal to unscrew the ventilator ducts so that he can do a classic crawling through the ducts move and get out. Yeah. The what is what is this stuff called? It's called the uh, the influence. The, the influence. influence, the influence. It's after curfew. Yes. But the secret legionnaires are now secretly outfitted once again with their secret legion suits. Mm -hmm. You think they all wear like around. domino masks at this point? Oh, we can't let them know it's us. Let's put on some yeah. domino masks. That green boy in the purple <laughs> boiler suit. I won't know who he is if he's wearing a domino mask. So again, this issue, there's some awesome things that I like. And the main thing that I like out of this issue is the fact that they're all doing teamwork. You know, you have certain people who are the punching people, you have right. certain people who are the bouncing people, and you have certain yes. people that are the run and hide and phase through walls people. They all got something to do, and yet they're working together. And, and it's unlike, again, as I've mentioned in previous episodes, unlike where we see people just flying around in their um, jet platforms, mm -hmm. everybody shooting, here everybody is doing, here's my specialty, let me be the person that tears down these walls. 
Yes, and that is way cool. That is really the strength of Shooter's use of the Legion because I I think I'm going to be able to tell you this, and I think you're going to agree with me. He is the best writer to date to use that large cast. Mm -hmm. Because last issue, we had everybody, including Supergirl, in play, and everybody got a little moment in the sun. You got a little Cosmic Boy, a little Lightning Lad, a little bit of everybody. And here you get a focus on some really underfocused legionnaires. You get some cool moments with Invisible Kid. We get to see our second big, you know, interaction with Karate Kid. And thankfully he's a little less of a jerk face here. Although he does still make a big point about the powerful Durlamite gates and how he probably won't be able to chop them in half with his bear. Oh, I totally did it, you guys. <laughs> because I am the awesome. Durlamite, by the way. Uh, is a, a 1970s movie. You remember Durlamite. He was a friend of Black Belt Jones. I thought he was the giant ape that was always causing everyone problems. <laughs> no, I think Durlamite is actually a calcium substitute that you can take intravenously. Are you sure this isn't the thing that you spread on crackers if you live in Australia? Oh, yeah, no. I'm pretty sure that Durlamite is actually that little thing that you put in the middle of a 45 to put it on the spindle so that it spins right. No, I think that's the thing that hangs down in the back of your, your throat, the, the Durlamite. <laughs> no, no, you actually, I think you're wrong. Durlamite is a, a special additive that you can put in the carburetor to make a funny car go even faster. No, I think, I, <laughs> I think Durlamite, <laughs> nope, I'm gone. Nope, that's it. You're gone. Durlamite is Chameleon Boy's fifth dimensional counterpart. There you go. <laughs> So we also get to see the Legion spies. We get to see Duo Damsel uh, pretend that she's a messenger girl and to deliver a secret message to the president inside, though, is shrinking Violet. And she escapes and is able to see what's going on. And they've got this whole plan of like break in, break out and let's hide Duo Damsel in a box. Yeah, it's all very Mission Impossible. Oh, yeah, it's really cool. Lorne who fl- sle- sneaks in, delivers her message. Everyone sees her leave. What they don't see is her leaving her duplicate behind. Mm hmm. You know, and they send a, an actual physical paper letter with sh- a tiny shrinking violet inside to Mr. Bowl Tax. You know, and if you were taxing my bowls, I'm going to be mad, especially if it's a bowl of cereal. President because I really bowl enjoy tax. it. Bowl those tax, are those things yeah. that get in your, uh, your flour if you don't clean it correctly. No, no, no. A bowl tax is the little lever. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I want to point out, I do want to point out two panels in this. That Mm -hmm. are brilliantly done. Uh, Later, everyone's meeting in some place where they're all hanging out. And it's two Uh separate panels. And on the left panel, you have uh, Cosmic Boy and Star Boy and Karate Kid and Lightning Lad standing around. And and Karate Kid sitting on a a chair. And then you literally have a gutter in the middle. And then in panel two, you have Bouncing Boy and you have Invisible Kid and Brainiac 5 and um, um, Phantom... Phantom, Phantom Girl, Girl yeah. yeah, Phantom Girl sitting there. And what you don't realize is Chuck's feet are in panel one. This is a connecting panel divided by the, gu- the, uh, the, the gutter, and it yep. is brilliant. And it really is amazing at showing that passage of time, because if it was one wide panel with all those balloons, it might be too crowded. But what we get is three people talking, then you move across and two more people talking and the whole time Chuck's just sitting there with his feet up going, God, I could go for a Danish. It's just, it's so subtle that you don't it pay attention is. to it until you're like, oh, there's a hand and feet. Oh, I see these panels are connected to one another and the gutter. I mean, it's just a perfect use of the medium. And it really makes me wonder again, I really wish we had access to shooters layouts because if that's a Jim shooter thing, that Swan put in the issue Mm -hmm. because it was in shooters layouts. Mm -hmm. That's really, really advanced, especially for a kid of that age. And if it's not 16 right now, yeah, 14, 15, something like that. Even if it's not, you're looking at this and going, okay, well either shooter is a prodigy or Kurt Swan is just that damn good because it's a beautiful. Could be. So they discover that in the water, there's something that is hypnotizing people. And this is how Boltax was able to take over the planet and turn it's everyone a trace against of the hypmo chemical. Yeah, the hypmo chemical. Hypmo chemical. We be hypnotized by the hypmo chemical. So now it's time for a breakout time. 
Tonight there's gonna be a jailbreak. And then it's nonstop action. Pow, pow, boom, pang, boom, boom, boom. Yep. Brainiac 5 is going to deliver the antidote into the aquifer, but he's knocked out. And then everybody thinks that the Legion has failed. But no. The potion did get in the water. And Brainiac's like, yeah, guys, it, it wasn't me. And they're like, wait a minute. What's wrong with Boltax's face? And they yank it's... Boltax's head off. And it's a rubber mask concealing. God dang it. Universo. God dang Universo. it. Universo. Okay. Scooby-Doo Look, moment, just Scooby-Doo moment that just totally ruined it for me. I was just like, no. Now, granted, it's, it's Universal, so that's kind of cool. It is. It's a callback to that issue 349 where we met Universo and his son, although we didn't actually see him named in 349. And here he gets a name, Rond Vidar. Yeah, but we know, we know what he looks like. So I wonder, do people, where people are looking at this and going, oh, that face looks familiar. Or, or were they looking at this going, oh, that's just generic face. Well, we, I think that we as readers were not supposed to immediately trip to the fact that, hey, this is the kid that we saw in 349. Mm -hmm. They hid it being Universo from us. Right. They, and they hit it really well. And I really do like the fact that in this issue, we have that long sequence, you know, two pages of Universo just trying to connect with his kid. All he wants is his son to love him. But unfortunately, he's a two faced, a tyrannical jerk. And, you know, it's never going to happen. But I don't think that the Scooby-Doo ending ruined it for me the way it did for you, simply because this is the 30th century. They finally might have a basis for the lifelike, perfect, realistic rubber mask phase. It's not actually rubber, Stephen. It's actually nanomites and dirlamites. Yeah, and it's probably some kind of synthetic uh, nanites yep. in there, too. They're, they're fighting it out. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just not a, I'm just not a fan of the Scooby-Doo ending, only because when it was in the original run of Scooby-Doo, it was kind of cool to see them do that three or four times or five times or every single time in that 13 episode run. Mm, but Steven. then when you do it every single time, mm -hmm. it gets old. Remember how this is June of 1967? I know, I know. Scooby-Doo hasn't aired yet. Scooby-Doo aired the, for the first time in 1969. I know. There are 24 episodes in the original season. But here's the problem, though. Okay retroactively because we're looking at this today true and because the you know i would have gotten away with it too if it hadn't been for you goody goody brats that's he literally says that <laughs> bah if not for that goody goody brat i'd have won <laughs> if it hadn't been for you, you know darn kids i mean retro retroactively knowing that we grew up at a time when scooby-doo was fresh and new and they kept piping pumping and piping and hyping that stupid pull off the rubber mask and it's farmer jones underneath it gets really, really old. So it doesn't matter if this came out two years before Scooby-Doo, if it's got almost the exact same line that maybe somebody borrowed to put in Scooby-Doo, this is a Scooby-Doo ending. And unfortunately, looking back at this through the, through the lens of today, mm -hmm. it just feels like another schlocky ending. Somewhere, somehow, we need to sit down and go through and see how many times they actually pulled off a rubber mask. Oh, in Scooby-Doo? Because, yeah, it wasn't every episode, because some of them wore helmets. Um, yeah, some the of space, them were actually tiki masks, so, you know. Right, the Space Kook wore a helmet, and the 10,000-volt ghost had just an electronic aura around yeah. him. And like I said, and the tiki Mono guide. Tiki -tia, yeah, yeah, he just had a, he just had a, a thing. But the, I, no, I thought the uh, Space, the space uh, Phantom guy was a mask. Space, it was a mask under a helmet. Oh, okay. All right. Space Kook was his name, by the okay. way. He was the Space Kook, and he went. I love, blah, 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 I love it when General Mills brings out his cereal at the beginning of it, of the Halloween season. <laughs> Space Kook and Frankenberry and Boo Berry right. and uh, right. what's what's Archduke the Archduke Chocula? Yeah, and what's the the Fruity Wolf? <laughs> Fruity Wolf. Isn't that there was the yummy, werewolf he was Yummy Mummy. Yeah? I remember. No, but there's a wolf that does fruit the Fruit Brute. Fruit Brute. Yeah, no. there you go. Was Fruit Brute, or was Fruit Brute the one who had the the gum? I don't know. One of our listeners, podcast at Majorspoilers.com. If you're old. If only Rodrigo were here. You he would probably know this. So then we find out that, oh, this is Ron Vidar. Ron Vidar. And, oh, this is the kid that saved us when we had to do the time travel cube thing that we uh, sent uh, Supergirl back in time with. Right. We sent the time warp again. Yeah. 
<laughs> and so, in honor of his twice saving the Legion through courageous acts, Ron Vidar is nominated as an honorary member of the Legion of Superheroes. So now we have five honorary or reserve backup guys. There's mm-hmm. Lana Lang. Yeah. Pete Ross. Yeah. Jimmy Olsen. Yeah. Ron Vidar. Yeah. And Kid Psycho. Kid Psycho in Dee Doo. Now, who is great because you can sing him to the Teen Titans theme. Now, we talked about this a little bit in the last episode or the last time that Ron Vidar showed up. Right. Is he a Green Lantern at this point? Yes, he is secretly Green Lantern at this point, according to continuity. Now, granted, this is mostly post crisis continuity. So some of it, well, it's all retcon by design and, you know, by definition, but some of it has to be questionable in terms of retconning. But yes, his father, Universo uh, Vidar, as he's home, universally he hated. Right. Universo was the Green Lantern of Sector 2416. Mm-hmm. He was actually the one who screwed up, got the Green Lanterns thrown out of the sector, and the Guardians immediately approached his son and gave him a ring after Vidar's ring went gazarch. So, yes, at this point, Rond is secretly a Green Lantern, which makes you wonder why he wasn't using his Green Lantern ring to bust out of uh, dad's, you know, secret. That's why I was wondering if this is, if he's a Green Lantern at this point. He, by definition, according to the way that I understand the time frame, yes. But then again, part of the thing that we find out later, why the Green Lanterns aren't on Earth is because the United Planets hates them. And I believe that there is a warning system that will tell the United Planets if a Green Lantern enters Earth. So mm. theoretically, it might also tell them if a Green Lantern is using his powers on Earth. Well, there's another thing that is kind of interesting in this in this issue, and it's not really spelled out. It's just that Universo says, my son and I are immune to the hypno powers of the water that I have put in here. It's hip, by the way, hypno powers. Whatever, hypno powers, hypno hip- powers. Get hip to this, man. Maybe. Oh. Maybe it's not some natural immunity that Rond has. Maybe it's his ring shielding him or protecting him from the effects of the water. Now, that is an interesting theory because you have to ask yourself, Rond was, was Rond immune to his dad's powers in the previous issue? Do I mean, he remember? certainly didn't fall uh, into lockstep for any of the shenanigans that his dad was doing, if that's what you're asking. I'm trying to remember 349. That was a long time ago. You know, the rings are supposed to be there to protect their their bearer. Right. And so it would seem that if you are consuming something that has the ability to uh, curtail your powers or to limit your abilities to do something, it would seem like the ring would fight back. Let, Let me guess. This has never been addressed ever, 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 ever. No, it hasn't. Man, where are these continuity writers that we've praised for so long that have said, oh, yeah, remember when so-and-so made a reference to this? And never have we been back to the Superboy planet. Never has Ron Vidar stepped forward and said, my power ring has secretly (laughs) protected me all this time. Never, ever, ever. You know what's really great, though? When I get angry at stupid comic books? (laughs) Yeah, well, also... Uh, fashion in the 30th century, because this issue establishes that Rond wears a little Lord Fauntleroy jacket. You know, I know you s- wears for the next 30 years. So, you know, um, there are rock musicians at this time. Right. Who are wearing jackets like this. You know, they're kind oh, of uh, high cut. Like, what are their names, Stephen? They're Br- yeah, They're definitely British people. Right. How do they talk? Um, a little bit better than your Ringo impression. How dare you? That was George. <laughs> See? See what I'm saying? Hi, uh, Steven. But yeah, they, really bad you know, they would wear the a high-cut um, jacket. And even today in women's fashions, you will see this high-cut bottom part of the jacket with long sleeves. I think not pointing out the Little Lord Fauntleroy jacket is probably something that we don't really need to call out. But certainly those weird-ass matador pants that he's wearing <laughs> do need to be called out. Rond wears this outfit for years. It is really weird, and it looks kind of futuristic, but also kind of Victorian. It's fascinating. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't like this issue. I know. 
That's sad. Yeah, you, they can't all be gems. I really enjoyed it, but I think part of that was Swan. If you enjoy the show, we would appreciate your support. You can find out more and become a Legion Clubhouse member at patreon.com slash major spoilers. Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, number 106, The Lone Wolf Legionnaire Reporter. Published October 1967. Written by Jim Shooter with art by Pete Costanza. Called to the 30th century for his news writing skills, Jimmy Elastic Lad Olsen finds a future super mystery. Another Jimmy Olsen issue, Matthew. What have you done? <laughs> well, here's the thing. As we said when we started this project, we're going to look at every Legion of Superheroes appearance that has some sort of resonance or some sort of meaning. Mm -hmm. And there have been uh, one, two, uh, maybe three Legion appearances in Jimmy Olsen since we last saw Jimmy. Right. This one is here for three reasons. Primarily, this is a book that is written by the active Legion writer coming out at the same time, basically in between two issues of the Legion. Mm -hmm. Jim Shooter does script this issue of Jimmy Olsen's. Secondly, it features Jimmy active with the Legion as Elastic Lad, which is pretty rare. I think there are maybe four or five stories where we actually see Jimmy in a Legion story being Elastic Lad. And third, and I think most importantly... Jimmy's got this really styling 30th century leisure suit with a big, <laughs> wide polka dot bow tie. And I felt like to deny you that would be just unfair. Well, so. and it's, it's really amazing because Shooter is, again, being somewhat forward thinking in what's going on here because Jimmy's lapels go all the way out past his shoulders, mm -hmm. which if you remember the fashions of the 70s. Yeah, man, them lapels got really, really wide. They did. He looks like Venus Flytrap's little brother. So, title of this story: The Lone Wolf Legionnaire Reporter. <laughs> because the Lone Wolf Legionnaire was already done in yeah. the first appearance of Timberwolf several issues ago. The first thing that strikes me of this story is we have Jimmy Olsen walking towards uh, the viewer, the reader, and in the background, there's all this chaos and stuff going on. He's he's all hunched over and and sad. And this is such a striking image. I could swear I have seen a modern version of this. I don't know if it's in Transmetropolitan. I don't know if it was in, you know, some, you know, hard luck case story. I don't know if it was Will Eisner. I don't know where I have seen something very similar to this before. But I'm like, oh, this is, I've seen this style and this composition before. And it's really, really cool and jumps out at, jumps out at me right away. It does feel very Eisner and something, you know, that we've run into with the Legion is we haven't gotten to talk about some of the major figures of Silver Age DC comics. Mm -hmm. This issue is one where Pete Costanza oh, does not, <laughs> Pete Costanza does not have much, if any actual work in adventure comics in the Legion. Oh, okay. There may be one, but Pete Costanza is one of those guys that everybody knows the art style. Everybody knows what a Pete Costanza story looks like mm -hmm. because Pete drew Jimmy Olsen literally for freaking ever. Yeah. No, it's really good. I really like his art style in this. It's got a lot of cool things, uh, especially when they're like, Jimmy, we brought you from the 1950s and we're going to make you wear a 30th century version of what they wore in the 1950s and 60s. Because that's how we work. It's in just the so weird. Century. I do like his, I do like his mon though. Yes, Pete Costanza does a really killer monel, and on page two or three, Jimmy, as Elastic Lad, is going through the time vortex to the future. Mm -hmm. That is the most heroic Elastic Lad has or ever will look. <laughs> I was going to say that Costanza really knows how to draw a stretchy lad, and it's to the borderline maybe a little bit creepy in that Jimmy is not only being the net and the cannon mm -hmm. and the cannonball that he shoots out of, but he doesn't know very splooge, you know, uh, not, I mean, maybe not splooge is not the, he doesn't have very like splurp, splurpy, <laughs> yeah, splurpy way. It's interesting. It is. It's, and you know, 
you don't see a lot of this. This is plastic man level silliness. Oh, yeah. Shape shifting. Mm -hmm. You don't see a lot of that with Jimmy as Elastic Lad. Jimmy's Elastic Lad transformations tend to be weird and stretchy. So it's really kind of fascinating to see Jimmy in full fledged hero mode doing plastic man shtick. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a Jack Cole kind of thing that they're doing here because they, you know, he's clearly working in Jack Cole territory with Mm -hmm. the stretchy. Yeah. The other thing that people may not realize is that we've discussed before that not only are the Legion of Superheroes heroes and they have hero duties to perform, as well as cleaning duties like scrubbing out the exhaust of their rocket ships. They also have to go to school right? and they have to make sure that they get the uh, the Legion Clubhouse bulletin out, the Legion bulletin out into the hands of, of officers throughout the universe. And essentially, they have the school newspaper that they have to produce on a, what is it, monthly basis? I think it's weekly is what she said. Okay. Let's check. Well, the problem is, mm-hmm. the problem is they got a lot of stuff going on and they are short on staff and they have to get this bulletin out tomorrow. Yep. And because Jimmy is a honorary Legion member and he's also a reporter, let's have Jimmy go out and find some interesting stories. Yes. about Crime. Jimmy, you are a top reporter. Uh, should be pointed out though, at, at this time, <laughs> Jimmy has been a porcupine. He has. Jimmy has been a giant turtle. He has. Jimmy has gone undercover as a girl. He has. So he does have some experiences yeah. in doing undercover work or doing, I don't know, what was the point of those stories? Like Jimmy un, uh, as a girl and, and uh, he would always do uh, something that would get him into trouble and then he would do a story on it and everyone's like, oh yeah, these Jimmy Olsen stories are great. Well, and Superman, in those early days, Superman would bail him out a lot. Mm-hmm. But it's worth noting that Jimmy had his own book for 20 years. Yeah. Jimmy, at this point, is 100 issues in. And I want you to think about some of our favorite heroes who never pulled off 100 issues. There are some really great characters out there who could not do what Jimmy did in 1954 through 74, basically. Mm -hmm. Yep. So at this point in time, Jimmy is still pretty well ensconced as a headliner at DC. Oh, no. I remember as a young child, as a young, young child in the early 70s. I would go to like the church um, garage sale or go to a garage sale or just be tripping around in other people's comics. And I was fascinated that here's Jimmy Olsen that has his own book. And we have Lois Lane, also girl reporter, having her own book. I was fascinated that those two characters had their own books. And I was like second and third grade, just amazed that we would see stories about, you know, the average, the support cast or the support members of the of the Superman family. Getting their own books. I thought that's the way all comic books worked at that time. Everybody has their own comic. Wow. They should. They really should. But remember why they have their own books. This is an early example of the power of television because Mm -hmm. both of those books started in 54 with the Superman live action TV show. Right. And And that was going into syndication in the 60s and the 70s. And so people knew who those characters were. That show spun out a sto- uh, their own individual titles, and they kept going. Mm-hmm. That is just really phenomenal to me. In 1967, even, books were getting canceled. The Creeper went four issues. You know, Steve Ditko, one of the legendary figures of comics, working for doing his own solo stuff at DC, four issues. Uh, New Gods under Jack Kirby didn't go very long either. Yeah, 12 issues of New Gods, 13 issues of Mr. Miracle. I mean, you look at what did and did not sell, and you have to come to a conclusion that Jimmy and Lois were sales powerhouses for probably a decade and a half. And I just find that fascinating. I love the fact that those books weren't always just, you know, Superman's amazing friends. Jimmy and Lois went off and did their own stuff, and here... Jimmy's a superhero dude. Yeah, he is. He uh, thinks he's saving a girl from being run over by the monorail. Turns out it's some kind of weird robot doll. He doesn't know what it is. He's like, oh, it's a realistic toy. It's a real doll. No. That's something else. That That is uh, something else entirely. Something else. Yes. Don't look it up, kids. Stay away. Don't. Yeah, don't. Don't. Then he goes to the museum because he's like, oh, maybe there'll be a story at the museum. And turns out there's nothing going on at the museum either. In fact, the guards think that he set off the alarm and they're going to chase him out. And then someone is stuck in a vault, which is really weird because this is very much like the time that um, 
is it Starboy who went back in time to Smallville and somebody got trapped in the, in the old man Carruthers got trapped in the vault and he was running out of air and Superboy had to come in and save him. Or maybe a Starboy went in and saved him. I forget. We've, we covered it in this, in this. Uh, yeah. Legion Starboy's Clubhouse. first appearance was like Superboy number, I want to say 80 something. Yeah. And so maybe Jimmy stretches and cr- crawls into the uh, cracks and crevices of this uh, per- world's perfect safe. And picks the lock so that the guy can get out and breathe easily. And then at the end of the day, Jimmy's like, oh man, I didn't find a single story of interest. I'll just sit here in front of this weird typewriter device. And in the morning, everyone's like, Jimmy, you did it. You saved the school paper. (laughs) It's all about the amazing feats that you performed, Jimmy. Feats? I've only got two feats. What are you talking about? Yuck. Because the child robot was actually incredibly valuable. Thieves had stolen it, and Jimmy recovered it. And that safe that he broke was the most unbreakable safe in the universe, and now every bank in the universe knows the weakness to that safe. And that gang who was in the guards in the museum, they were actually bad guys, and Jimmy stopped the bad guys from robbing the museum. I mean, Jimmy is an incredible superhero. He saves the day. It's almost like... If there was a book with his name on the cover, he would be the hero of the story. It's almost like that, which makes you wonder why they don't have, I mean, at this point, even 106 issues of it. But c'est la vie, n'est pas? Yeah. Did you like this story? I mean, I thought it was kind of fun and cutesy. It's a it's a really uh, it's a really good palate cleanser uh, for a lot of some of the serious stuff that we've been in uh, in the last couple of Legion of of Superheroes uh, stories where they're in jail or they're being hunted to the last man, or, you know, they're in a Stalag locked up. Uh, the world doesn't yeah. like them. They're having some crazy time travel adventures. This is just kind of like a, Hey, remember all the goofiness that used to go on in comics before they got too serious and too intense here. Here's yeah. a little taste of that again. Yeah. I love this story and it comes down to two words. Pete Costanza. <laughs> Costanza. Well, so yeah. another thing that I like about his art that we don't see a lot, and it's something that does concern me at times, is that too often we just see the blank background, you know, a, a solid swatch of, of color behind the character, and we never see any of the environment. Here Costanza is going through, and he's like, let's look at this city of the future, which looks an a, awful lot like uh, Metropolis from 1933. A little bit of a problem there from his, his future's point of view. Oh, no, that's uh, Fritz Lang sent that movie back from the future. Oh, okay. Uh, But then, I mean, even when he's traveling back to the Legion Clubhouse, I mean, Costanza fills the panel with cityscape. I mean, this is Metropolis of the future. Of course, it's going to have big buildings and it's going to be very crowded. Let's see that, which is something that we don't see in other artists. Yeah. A lot of times, you know, you will see people take shortcuts or make, you know, quickie things to get the issue out. But... I really love, and Kurt Schaffenberger is another artist of the same era who does the same thing. Schaffenberger did a lot of Supergirl stuff, Mm -hmm. but Schaffenberger and Costanza share really, really expressive faces. So you can sit and you can read a Kurt Schaffenberger or a Pete Costanza comic and just go page to page and look at Jimmy's expressions. We like here he's suspicious here. He's mad here. He's amazed at the exhibit of badges. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's just wonderful to look at the expressiveness. And of course, that really, really keen 30th century leisure suit. I would I would also I guess it looks good on someone like Duo Damsel. Mm-hmm. But um, when guys are wearing the tunic that's just just covers their behind, uh-huh. and they've got long sleeves on their shirts, mm-hmm. something just doesn't feel right about that. Ooh, I'm chilly up top, but ah, there's a paradise down below. It just is really weird fashion. Are and you I, making fun of Monel's Nehru jacket tunic dress? No, I'm making fun of it, like in the bank. Look at all the the bankers in the vault. <laughs> like here's this guy wearing like a, a diaper. And, uh-huh. and a big old uh, collar thing. And then there's this oh. other guy who's wearing a tunic and he's got long sleeves. And then you've got another guy who's, you know, hoping that there's not a breeze. I understand well, feeling free and having fun. But some of the fashion sense of the future just makes no sense to me. I mean, it's like they literally have been watching Star Trek, which I know hasn't come out yet. It will. And they're just borrowing everything from that. This is what the future will look like. Roman times. 
But this is important, and this is you know something that you don't think about, and I think it will help to assuage your. Oh issue. no, it won't. When you work in the bank, you have to keep your tattoos covered. And all of these men <laughs> used to belong to the Dark Riders Motorcycle Club. So they have full sleeve tats that they have to cover. But their legs are uncovered for ventilation, yet warmth. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> it's such a negative Nelly. You know, I think the best part of this issue for me, other than Pete Costanza's art, is the backup story that ends with Superman knocking a bomb back into another dimension and literally bombing another country or another planet back to the stone age. Oh, wow. That's that, weird. I didn't read the backup the, story. I was just like, eh, I'm not interested. I'm just here for the Legion. Yeah. And that's the thing. I, I was looking at that last panel. I'm like, wait, what with the what? And it turns out that the joke at the end is they try to throw a bomb at earth. It bounces off Superman's invulnerable chest back through a time space dimensional portal and blows up their entire civilization. Da, 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 da. Tip your waiter, kids. Okay. Well, Matthew, we have come to the end of another Legion Clubhouse. What have we learned this week? Well, I think we've learned that four-color printing is a real crapshoot. I think we've also learned that even Jimmy Olsen can be cool. Yes, and most importantly, we've learned that if someone throws a bomb at you and they get blown up... The Bugs Bunny rules apply. It's still funny. That wraps it up for this installment of the Legion Clubhouse. Thank you so much for checking us out this week. If you have questions or comments, we would love to see them over at Majorspoilers.com in the comments section for this episode. Also, if you would be so kind, head over to Apple Podcast and share some of those fabulous five-star reviews. It actually does help us get seen by a lot more people, and that helps this uh, community of Legion of Superheroes fans grow week after week. We'll be back next time for more Legion Clubhouse adventures. And until then, I'm the Stretchy Kid. And I'm Derlamite. The Legion Clubhouse is a production of Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC, and is produced by Steven Schleicher. Your hosts were Matthew Peterson and Steven Schleicher. You can follow Matthew at Mighty King Cobra and Steven at Major Spoilers. You can follow this podcast on Twitter at Legion Clubhouse. If you have questions or comments, send them to podcast at Majorspoilers.com. I'm Jason Inman. Until next time, eat it, Grandpa. This podcast is copyright 2018 by Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC.